much, Gillian, and thanks to all of the team at ARC for asking me to work on this issue over the past number of years and for asking me to pre uh, prepare the research updates themselves. Um, I think the having the opportunity to look at the, the kind of data over the past number of years has not only given me an insight into what's happening on a year-by-year -year basis, but it's also, as Gillian said, helping to kind of gauge how things are changing, how th trends that might be staying the same, things which might be getting worse. And I'm going to perhaps try and tease out some of those issues today and try and get um, you to see maybe where there are particular problems and to maybe think about perhaps the rationale. I'm a qualitative researcher. I do a lot of work doing interviews with people. So sometimes working with data is, is, is quite interesting for me because it, it kind of opens up new questions that I can ask people um, when I'm p potentially interviewing them or doing focus groups or other, other kind of research with them. So just to kind of consider what I'm going to do today. There are three themes that I'm going to explore in depth in relation to the 2014 uh, Northern Ireland Life and Times data, which we're going to look at in, in more detail. The first of these themes is the levels um, and the nature of social contact that has been occurring between participants and members of minority ethnic communities. So that question has been asked now for a number of years. So we're going to look at the 2014 data and maybe also consider as I say, some of the data over the past uh, number of years as well. The second issue that I'm going to consider are questions relating to perceptions of prejudice. Um, that question and the data from it relates both to how much prejudice respondents feel that there is in Northern Ireland generally. So that may be asking people who are not members of ethnic minorities themselves how they feel ethnic minorities are prejudiced or not in Northern Ireland. So it's quite interesting. It gives us a wider s sweep. If we, I think if we asked ethnic minorities themselves, we may get a very different response. But with this question, we'll get uh, some kind of idea of um, the, the perceptions of prejudice from the wider scope of respondents. And then finally, relating to that context of uh, perceptions of prejudice, I'm going to discuss uh, acceptance levels with regard to minority ethnic communities. So what levels, and what do I mean by that, we'll kind of see in a bit more detail as I, as I go forward, but how, do, how far do respondents accept ethnic minorities as members of wider society? OK, so sorry that some of the um, slides are a bit small here. The data is actually on the research updates. We did try to get it on the projector, but unfortunately, that kind of thwarted us today. Um, so if we look at, first of all, at the issue of social contact, the survey asked respondents uh, if they had friends or neighbours who were members of ethnic minority communities. So I suppose that this question was asked in the survey as the responses give us some insight into what might be viewed as more intense social encounters. So especially the context of friendship suggests that a more meaningful uh, relationship has, has, has occurred as opposed to just a fleeting interaction like a, a mere greeting on the street or a uh, meeting at the bus stop for instance. But of course it does not It does uh, kind of relate back to what someone interprets the word friend to mean. Could that just be work colleague for instance? But nonetheless this is, this is what people were asked. So the question on whether or not individuals have friends of neighbours from different ethnic or national backgrounds has been asked now very regularly in the Northern Ireland Life and Time survey for a number of years. So we can perhaps now chart uh, some of the changes that have occurred over, say, the last decade or so. So what I'll do here is I'm just going to give you a look at the responses from 2006 on those questions and compare them to 2014. So we can see how many respondents to the Northern Ireland Life and Time survey actually had friends or neighbours at th those two different periods. So first of all, with regards to friends, we can see that back in 2006 that it was primarily uh, the Chinese, Black African Caribbean, South Asian and Polish, which were the groups that appeared to have the largest engagement with the wider population in this particular category. Um, around or just over 10% of respondents at this time had friends from those particular groups. And then, of course, you had smaller numbers for some of the other groups as well, you know, Filipino, um, Portuguese, Irish traveller. And th the question of Bulgarian and Romanian wasn't asked because that was relating to EU enlargement, which was asked, uh, included in the survey at a later date. Um, and we'll see the results from that 
now. So by 2014, these groups were still the most common, but you can see that the percentages, the numbers of people who were saying that they had friends from across these different groups had increased quite significantly during this period. So you can see that friendships with members of the Polish community saw the biggest increase, that doubled to 22%. Uh, Black African, Caribbean and Chinese also saw large increases at this period. And indeed in other groups there, like uh, the Portuguese and Filipino, there has also been uh, some increase. The smallest increase, however, was, if you look at it there, the smallest increase was with regard to the indigenous Irish traveller population. Um, that only saw a small increase from 3 to 4 percent. So overall, the, the figures would suggest that increasing interaction between ethnic minorities and the general population, however, that's not the case for all communities and perhaps it's shocking in some ways that the indigenous population is the one which still, which we see on a year to year basis, is the one which is the most marginalised of all ethnic minority communities. So these changes, um, you know, I would be really interested to hear why perhaps you think some of these changes are. Is it just more contact, more frequency? Does it suggest more in the way of integration? Does it suggest a change in uh, workforce, change in work uh, environment? Has it been in relation to the work that community uh, services have been doing? I think that's a huge, a huge part of it. Um, but generally there has been, and maybe it's something that happens over time as well. You know, the friendships have developed over time and it's something which doesn't just happen overnight. Um, when it came to neighbours, exactly, very often the same trends were evident uh, with increases between 2016 and 2014 across most groups. First and foremost, I think that that kind of bucks the trend where a lot of people have said, oh, we don't have immigration to Northern Ireland anymore because of the recession and a lot of communities have started to go home. We know that this is a much more permanent um, feature of social life in, in Northern Ireland and perhaps the, the data here shows that. And it was the Polish community which again saw the biggest increase as, as neighbours, 7 to 14 percent. Um, again though it's quite telling that it was the indigenous Irish traveller population which had the least change across these two questions in the survey. And we did see uh, increases um, also from all of the communities uh, um, and Bulgarian, Romanian and other Eastern European which were asked for the first time of course in that question as well. Uh, one factor which I suppose we have to be a bit cautionary about when we look at this, this particular data is that we might consider both of these as indicating positive relationships have been, have been uh, developing but we know that the word neighbour doesn't necessarily mean that you, know, you, you get on with your neighbours. This second column perhaps gives us an indication of the change in geographical environment, as it were, the social environment of towns and cities in Northern Ireland shows that uh, it suggests something more about the permanency of immigration as well, that you know, people use that term neighbour perhaps as someone who's, who's maybe more you know, in, a, in a region for a more permanent uh, length of time. Now the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey also asked respondents if they had come into contact with people from uh, ethnic minority groups. And if they had come into contact with ethnic minor minority groups, to think about the nature of the contact that they have had. So I suppose this question in the survey aims to investigate further the nature of interactions that might be taking place between respondents and ethnic minorities. I don't think this one is in the, sli in, in the, in the actual research update. It's just something that I pulled out because you can get the whole list of data actually from the ARC website as well. There's much more data that's actually available to you as well. So please do go and look at that if these issues are of interest to you. But it's quite telling when we look at this um, pie chart that for the majority of people who were surveyed, so the orange section, which was almost 40%, the contact was only merely a greeting. Um, a hello in the street, maybe an acknowledgement or a good morning, which we might define as just a social courtesy as opposed to actually any meaningful engagement that might lead to more a fleeting encounter perhaps. However, 27% uh, 
in the blue, just over a quarter of those who had interactions with ethnic minorities had a much closer and lengthier interaction, such as a detailed conversation. Um, a further 27%, um, which was in the grey there, or it looks white actually when you're, I'm looking at it from here, but a further 20% stated that their interaction was something in between a greeting and a one-off conversation or interaction. But of course I suppose a lengthier conversation may still be the result of that kind of something in between as well. So it's all kind of about uh, the different levels of contact that particular chart. Again that ties back to the previous slide in that while there has been an increase in those having friends and neighbours from ethnic minorities, there are probably questions about the ways in which more substantial and uh, meaningful interactions can be encouraged. I mean, I, I think that's something that obviously the community sector itself is massively involved in, but um, that's obviously a critical question for policymakers, I think, to kind of deal with that day-to-day -day interaction of how people, employers as well, for instance, how their employees are interacting with one another in, in the work environment too. Maybe a very interesting uh, place to look at. Okay, so just moving on to another theme which is uh, related. Another section of the survey dealt specifically with the perceptions of prejudice against members of minority ethnic communities. And this is an issue that has been covered in many, again, in many of the Northern Ireland Life and Time surveys for quite some time now. So this section here again, we can consider the change in nature and the trends when we look at the 2014 uh, data. Okay, so one of the questions that has been asked in successive Northern Ireland Life and Time surveys has been whether or not respondents felt that there was a lot or hardly any uh, prejudice against people from minority ethnic groups. So basically this question was there, was included to measure how respondents feel ethnic minorities are treated by the wider society. And you can see a very clear, clear um, trends that have emerged from that when you look at this data. I'll just explain it now. If we chart this issue back to 2007, which is at the, at the far left side, that was really at the height of the increased period of immigration that we witnessed just after EU enlargement. And 2007 appeared to be um, the most pessimistic period to date when over 40% of respondents felt that there was a lot of prejudice against people from minority ethnic backgrounds. Again, as I said, that's the perception of the general population. That's the perception of all of the respondents to the survey. So maybe ethnic minorities may not have felt that way, but this maybe shows us how wider society s views itself as dealing with this question of, of immigration and, and diversity. Um, so as I said, in 2007, 40% uh, felt that there was a lot or um, that there was a lot of prejudice against people from minority ethnic backgrounds. You see that on the blue line there. But at that period as well, under 10% felt that there was hardly any prejudice against ethnic minorities. So that's on the red line. You can see that's kind of closer to the ground as it were. Okay? There was, however, clearly an improving picture that took place between 2009 and 2013 when it appeared that there was much more optimism in relation to this issue. And I would again be interested to hear why people might think that was. Maybe it was people were adapting to integration, they were seeing the positives, they were viewing the benefits of it, and they maybe felt that uh, good relations was perhaps working in some respects. Um, and at this period you can see that the numbers who said that there was a lot of prejudice dropped from over 40% in 2007 to less than 30% um, by 2013. So last year was kind of a, a great optimist, an optimistic period in some respects from the data. However, this improvement has not continued in the past year. And the 2014 data showed quite a marked increase again in the, the number of people saying that they felt that there was a lot of prejudice against people from minority ethnic communities. So the number of people who think the prejudice on the increase, again, you can see it's climbing up quite, significant, quite significantly actually in the past year. Perhaps, remember this data was taken in 2014. 
we know that there was a, a bit of a, a storm at, at, at Stormont, for example, last year. There were questions around race and diversity that were raised in relation to particular politicians as well, such as Anna Lowe, for example. You had the question um, about the comments that were made about Islam. So in the last year, perhaps, the wider population is very aware of those issues that are occurring, and that might very well shape their responses. And indeed, next year it will be really interesting, given what's happening not locally but internationally, how people also react to this particular question too. Um, okay, so the survey also asked individuals if they uh, felt that they were they themselves were prejudiced in some ways. I always think this is a very interesting question. The, the ways that it's asked and the ways it teases out people's prejudices in some ways, if they have them. Um, if they said yes to this question that they felt that they were prejudiced, they were then asked to say whether they were um, either very or a little prejudiced. Okay. So first of all, respondents, as I said, were asked whether the, if they were either very or a little prejudiced towards people from minority ethnic backgrounds. And this, is, this was asked, as I said, a number of years. And you can see that back in 2010 on the slide, 32% um, of all respondents in the survey said that they held either very or some uh, prejudiced views. The trend since then has been a decrease between 2012 and uh, 2013. The figure dropped to 27%. And in 2014, it dropped to 24%. However, quite a, uh, you know, quite, still quite a significant number, a quarter of respondents said that they felt that they were a little or very prejudiced. Um, of the respondents who said that they were a little or very prejudiced, they were also asked further questions to investigate this. They were asked, first of all, um, if they avoid avoided, sorry, displaying their prejudice. So they were asked if they held prejudice views, did they actually make a concerted effort to avoid displaying that? Um, and if we look at the figures in more detail, in 2010, 91%, so most people who said that they had some prejudice views, 91% um, said that they um, were a little or very prejudiced and they said that they didn't actually display this openly. It was something that they tried to avoid. Um, however, we see this changing, and less people have stated in, in the survey since then that they try to avoid acting on their prejudice. So it's gone from 84 down to 81, uh, down to 80 in 2014. And of course, the implications of that are that um, Sorry that it's kind of stressed a little bit. I think this is because I'm using the Mac. So I'm, I'm, it's, it's not. Um, it's, but the, this third question was, my behavior is consistent with my prejudice. So in other words, people who acted on their prejudice, people who acted in some way. Um, back in 2010, it was 9%. In 2012, 15%. And in 24, it's gone up to 18%. So that perhaps would suggest that there's a little bit of a, a problem in relation to that particular issue itself. So just to summarize that, in the past four years, the number of people who said that they were um, very or a little prejudiced has actually dropped. However, in the past year, the number of people whose behavior was consistent with their prejudice had actually has actually increased a little bit. Okay, so there is a, a problem in, uh, perhaps in that area as well and, and finding out specifically how people act on their prejudice. Is it you know, perhaps a, in an institutionalized way in wh which they are you know, maybe not providing opportunity or is it a more overt action, you know, physical violence or whatever kind of action we might be considering there. Okay, so another section of the survey this year also investigated beyond this question of prejudice and try to determine the levels of acceptance of minority ethnic people. I know they're kind of related questions in, in some respect. And um, this is again is something perhaps which has had a lot of attention within the media over the past number of years, this, uh, the, the question of acceptance within wider Northern Ireland society. You know, how can, uh, for instance, racism and sectarianism be viewed uh, as, as social problems? I think they, they've definitely come to the fore, obviously, but 
the, the questions from the Northern Ireland <coughs> Life and Times, as I said, also try to uh, delve into levels of acceptance socially, culturally, economically and politically, and that's what I'm going to discuss here. So respondents were asked if they felt they were um, able to accept um, minority ethnic communities um, across a number of different areas of social life. And they were asked about four particular groups uh, specifically. They were asked about travellers, they were asked about Eastern Europeans, other minority ethnic groups and Muslims. And I think this is just a cross section. This isn't, the, these four were picked, I think, because they had originally been, I think, used in the, sur the census surveys a few years ago. And perhaps maybe there it would be good to have a broader range of, of groups on this particular question. But nonetheless, I think it does tease out some very interesting things. So first of all, respondents were asked if they would accept these groups in a number of different social settings. And as you'll see, the social settings get closer to the personal life of the respondent. And we'll see how that affects the responses of people who are responding to the survey. So first of all, respondents were asked, um, again, I think this is on your, on your research update, just in case it's too small there, but respondents were asked if they would accept these groups as a tourist visiting Northern Ireland. And of course, that question wasn't necessarily relevant to the Irish traveller population, which is why there's a, a dash there. But most respondents were willing to accept the three groups um, but there's a trend which begins to emerge straight away. Now, again, it's not a 100% <laughs> acceptance rate, which I find quite shocking that you're asking about tourists. I mean, and you're s not everyone is saying yes. So we get 83% um, for Eastern Europeans, 85% for other minority ethnic groups. And look at what happens when you ask this question about Muslims. You see that there's a major distinction straight away. And that's a trend which continues throughout the, the different um, social contexts which were presented to respondents. Respondents were also asked then if they would accept a member of a minority ethnic group as a resident of Northern Ireland living and working here. Um, however, this, as I said, this is a much more permanent uh, context than a tur tourist, of course. And what you see is that the, the results accordingly dip because you're asking this question about, um, about residency. So 77% Eastern Europeans, 83% for other minority ethnic groups, and look what happens again when you look at Muslims, 64%. And bearing in mind this was last year, I think it'll be really interesting to come back next year and see where that, where that figure is uh, next year. Um, the third scenario was living at, in a house as a resident in my local area. And we did ask this question about travellers, of course. So you can see straight away, only 49% of respondents said that they would accept the traveller as a resident in their local area. 72% Eastern Europeans, so again, a drop. 77% for other minority groups. And 57% for Muslims. The next um, scenario was as a colleague in work. You can see there that actually there's a, a quite a, a significant uh, thing to mention about uh, social distance in some ways. That the traveller is travellers are the only ones really who seem to buck the trend here in some respects. That more people would accept a traveller as a work colleague than as a resident in their area, where it's, it seems to be um, the other way around for. The other groups, okay. So it's 64% uh, for Eastern Europeans, other minority groups 67%, and Muslims again dips and is quite significantly less alongside Irish travellers. So I think that sets the bar of where those two particular groups are viewed within wider society. And then this is the one which really I think hits home to respondents. It asks them, would you be willing to accept one of these groups as a member of your close family through marriage? So you're asking them, would you accept them? as an in-law, okay? So we see straight away across the board that the, the figures dip. We know Northern Ireland, you know, the, the practice of, I think it's the, soci the sociological term, I think is endogamy. You know, marrying within your community is kind of quite, still quite prominent even in post-conflict Northern Ireland. Maybe that, you know, shapes some of this as well. I'm, I'm just throwing something out here that, that maybe that is one of the reasons why it's so ingrained to some extent, but Obviously, I think it does also raise serious questions about the nature of the relationships that we have 
with newcomer communities that they are maybe not so personal. And even those people who are willing to accept maybe don't have those engagements with people and, and view them on the basis of stereotypes rather than actual knowledge of their, their actual interactions with people. Okay, so I always think that's a really interesting uh, question to look at. Okay, so now if we look at the question in relation to marriage, there are some interesting comments that can also be made um, in relation to the, the breakdown of age that we see in that. So I'm just taking Eastern Europeans here as an example. But we were able to break the respondents down into age groups so from 18 to 24 right up to 65 plus. And what we can see there is that perhaps unsurprisingly in some respects it's the 65 plus age group which is the least accept and maybe less you know, understanding or knowledge of diversity and that they've grown up in a place which was not so diverse maybe more ingrained in their views, less likely to change. But I think one of the important things to take out of that is the 18 to 24 category quite surprised me. The group which grows up, has grown up in a more diverse Northern Ireland is the second most, or second least accepting of that particular scenario, 46%. Um, so again, I, you know, we don't have a rationale as to why that is. Maybe they're still very much influenced by significant others, by their parents. Um, by things that adults are saying, by what they are saying in the, the general media. Maybe, you know, we know that there's issues around employment for that um, that particular age group, and we know that sometimes employment and immigration have been have gone hand in hand as kind of a, a difficult issue. People can't get jobs because immigrants get them, which you know we know is is not a you know in not any way, shape, or form is 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 a truth. But at the end of the day, people maybe still use that rationale for this. But I think, nonetheless, it shows that that age category is a, is a very important one, I think, to, to deal with. And I think, obviously, the youth sector and um, schools and, and even the syllabus in, in, in our schools and even our universities as well, I think, needs to kind of engage more with this topic of diversity. Uh, you can see the most, kind of most liberal group was the 30, 25 to 34-year-olds, so maybe that is actually the age group which gives us an indication because they're the ones who are kind of maybe, you know, they've become adults as it were and are not so influenced by others and have made up their own minds. And maybe they also have been exposed more to diversity than other groups as well. So I would be interested to hear perhaps why people think the distinctions on age like that are, are actually there. Um, when we look at the question on whether or not respondents would accept a member of an ethnic minority into their family through marriage, we can also again chart the responses of this over time. And quite, and quite pessimistically, we can perhaps see that the acceptance rates have tr tried to drop uh, quite significantly. So back in 2007, acceptance levels of groups were generally stronger across the four categories. But we can see that since 2010, and in the past two years in particular, there's been quite a significant drop in positive responses to this question. So you can see uh, how that question has perhaps dipped <coughs> between, say, from around 2010 onwards, we've seen a gradual drop in that. Again, perhaps as the recession hits, as people become more skeptical about immigration, um, maybe the media is changing its, its view on immigration. We know government has changed as well, so the views on immigration have changed there. Perhaps those wider uh, issues are shaping what's happening in Northern Ireland as well. So we can see from that, from 2010 to 2014, there has been a dip across all of the four categories. Travellers, though, again, are the group which are at the, at the bottom of the acceptance uh, list on that. Okay, so... Um, Another question that was asked was in relation to kind of the social participation, the wider participation that ethnic minorities have uh, across different public areas or different uh, areas of social, cultural and political engagement. So I'm just going to run through those that I have here at the moment. So they were asked if they thought ethnic minorities participate a lot in the following areas since... I think we've asked this since 2005, so we can see it from 25 to 2014 here. So first of all, they were asked uh, about school governors. Would, did they think ethnic minorities participated as school gov governors? And that had increased from 2% back in 2005 to the highest current level of 
11% in 2014. Uh, politicians uh, from 2005, that's 3% up to 13% in 2014, again, obviously on a low, but also in local councils as well, perhaps recent council elections um, as maybe changing things as well. Perhaps we could say that political engagement is still not reflective of the 4% of ethnic minorities who are actually here, but nonetheless, some of our participants are actually suggesting this. Um, the area of business had been one social area where there had been a consistent kind of high level of um, acknowledgement, I suppose, of the contributions of ethnic minorities. So you can see that even back in uh, 2005, almost 20% said that they uh, considered ethnic minorities to be prominent in business. And by 2014, that's actually dipped a little, but it's been kind of consistent in the, you know, between 13 and 20% over the past 10 years. Uh, leaders within church organisations was also another area where you saw uh, a lot of engagement, but again that has dipped slightly, but one of the ones which has remained more consistent over the past 10 years. So it's dropped from 27% in 2005 to 21% in 2014, but nonetheless still a pretty strong showing across the past uh, 10 years. Then finally, uh, we had the question on commentators in uh, the media on issues concerning minority ethnic communities. And again, that is one which is at the highest level of 14%. So perhaps this gives us an indication of the change in social and cultural landscape of Northern Ireland. It doesn't necessarily give us an indication of whether or not respondents view these as positive contributions. That might be a very different question if we asked it, but it, it gives us an indication of how people perceive Northern Ireland to be changing, perhaps, in some respect. Okay, so just to come to some of the key points um, that I, I've raised from the... Thankfully, I think I've, t I've kept to the time. <laughs> just, like, um, just to summarise some of the key facts that have come through, and again, you may find more if you go into the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey website. All of the data is there all of the charts and tables and everything that you can pull up on all of the different questions and a copy of the survey as well, which is quite useful in seeing how the questions were asked. You can see the actual contact between respondents and members of minority ethnic communities as friends, and I put that in <laughs> kind of quotation marks because what does someone define as a friend? Uh, our neighbours has increased significantly since 2006. Ethnic minorities have become more visible in aspects of public life, as I just kind of showed on the, on the previous slide. 37% said that ethnic minorities face a lot of prejudice. That's up from 26% last year. So there, uh, again, seems to be a change on that particular question. That is still not as high as the figure of 45% recorded in 2009, but still it might give us um, you know, a, a bit of an indication of where things stand. The downward trend in accepting uh, minority ethnic groups through things like marriage, for example, has continued to decline uh, for a third year in a row. So again, we'll have to consider whether or not that is um, something which will continue next year as well. The oldest and the youngest age categories appear to be those with the least welcoming attitudes when it came to age groups. And it was the 25 to 34 year old group which showed the um, highest levels of acceptance of ethnic minorities. So it was, th it was that particular age group. So that is the kind of overall view of where the data is at at the moment. And um, as I said, uh, that was just me trying to pick out some interest in trends from it. But there is much more there. There's a wealth of information there from the social attitudes that we see. And I think it raises more questions, perhaps, than what can be answered from what I've presented today. But nonetheless, I think it points to clues and gives a qualitative researcher like me a lot of avenues to explore when I'm going to talk to people and ask them about how their lives are, are kind of progressing within Northern Ireland as well. So thank you. Thanks.